Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the special preview to our ClassicsToday.com insider subscriber feature on the 10 best recordings of Rudolf Kempa. So if you are not a ClassicsToday.com subscriber, please have a look down below. There's a link and consider subscribing if you are. Just swoop on over to ClassicsToday.com and enjoy the special feature on Rudolf Kempe, who was a fascinating figure, actually. And as a preview, um, I want to talk about some sort of a philosophical or historical, quasi-historico-philosophico topic. And that is the insecurity of the German musical establishment and consequently what happens if your Fach is not in the great German classics. And Kempe is a special case in that regard. He really is. German music, now this is going to be a lot of gross generalization, but there really is, you know, my, my, my field, my background was was in German cultural history. That's what I have a master's degree in. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that because I'm just not winging it off the top of my head. This is actually, you know, you can research this. And there are, are interesting theories about it. But you know, German musical culture was far more significant than than in many other countries in terms of the impact it had on people's lives and on their definition of, of being German. And the reason was because Germany was not Germany until unification in the 1870s. I mean, before that, you know, there was there was basically, you know, a bunch of little little carved up duchies and 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 states and and you know king things. And then there was the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, much of which was German speaking. And you had Bavaria, and you had Prussia, and you had everything in between. You had Weimar and, you know. So, so German cultural objects were the things that more than anything else defined what it was to be German. In the absence of a central political nation state called Germany. This is just the opposite of what happened in France. France was an extremely centralized kingdom, you know, all put together under one guy, you know, one monarch, and 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 organized and directed from Paris. Germany had nothing even remotely similar until unification, until the you know it actually became Germany, and so and so the entire cultural establishment in Germany, the German-speaking lands, um, during the nationalist awakening of the 19th century, was founded on this, this idea of German culture, what it was to be German. And, you know, Wagner was, was the logical outcome of that, you know, the Heilige Deutsche Kunst that he talks about in, in the, at the end of Die Meistersinger, Holy German Art. It was the thing that defined the German people. And that put a lot of pressure, really a lot of pressure, on German composers. First of all, it made German composers masters of instrumental music more than it did music with text. And there's a very good reason for that. The reason was because opera was Italian and, and easily Italian. It was, it was popular culture in Italy. And so, and so the German version of that sort of thing took a long time to get started. It really did. I mean, that's another reason why Wagner is as important as he is, because he became the avatar of the German version of that thing that everybody else in Europe, including in Germany, loved. You have to remember, one of the things that made German composers so neurotic, and Beethoven is a case in point, Beethoven's attitude toward Rossini is a case in point. It drove Beethoven crazy that all, all everybody loved Italian opera. The great singers were Italian. The great opera composers were Italian. They traveled around Europe. It was the same thing in England. It was the same thing in every country except possibly France, which had its own operatic tradition, which was sucked up from the Italian, but Frenchified, as the French always do. They just borrow what they want and then call the result French. 
It's a very smart way to do it, by the way. But the Germans couldn't because they weren't that organized. So that meant that where Germany excelled was in instrumental music, polyphonic music, contrapuntally based music, because Italian operas and Italian music was, was songs, popular songs, homophonic music, music without extraordinary gobs of, of, of you know, sort of intellectual and, and, and abstruse musical science behind it. And the German musical culture, as a result, emphasized, well, we know what the result was. The result was symphonies and chamber music, and it was wonderful, and we were happy, and then Wagner came around and you got operas. And then you had Rudolf Kempe. <laughs> I'm getting to Kempe. Why am I getting to Kempe? Because Kempe answers is, 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 is a phenomenon. He was a German conductor whose specialty was not German music. He was a great opera conductor. You could say, yes, his specialty was opera. I mean, one of his specialties was a fabulous opera conductor. Of course, we all know that, a fabulous Wagnerian. But you can argue, I think very strongly, that Wagner was not particularly German because the operatic tradition in which Wagner worked, as Ned Roram has pointed out, was largely French. And because Wagner's style, being theatrical and operatic, was not essentially a contrapuntal style. Never mind Die Meistersinger. Yeah, it has some, you know, a fugue or some combined themes. Essentially, Wagner was a colorist. He really was. And so was Kempe. He was a chord guy. He wasn't a line guy. And notwithstanding the fact that he recorded a complete Beethoven cycle and he did Brahms, you know, he had to do all of that stuff. And he did it. It wasn't where his heart was. It wasn't what he was really good at. This was also true to an extent of Herbert von Karajan. I mean, he managed to like snow everybody into thinking he was the great German conductor and that his Beethoven was the greatest Beethoven because you know the great German orchestra with the great German conductor has to be the best in German music. But he wasn't, and we all know he wasn't, and neither was Kempe. The result of this, I should add, is that his career was was kind of kind of odd on disc because however wonderful he was, the stuff that he was most wonderful at was not the kind of thing that was going to get him a lot of acclaim in the German speaking world. I mean nobody nobody, you know, goes nuts over the way you play, for example, oh, I don't know. Well, you know, Humperdinks, Hansel and Gretel. Or Strauss, Richard Strauss even. I mean, you know, we know where to find the best of Kempe. And I have no problem saying that because I'm going to be picking and choosing amongst it in the special subscriber video. But, you know, there's the Strauss box. And then there's this thing, the Icon box. And there is a supplemental box that was on Testament, much of which is now in the Icon box. And there was a Scribendum box. And there was some stuff on Decca. He is the accompanist. He was a fabulous accompanist. For example, that Kyung Hwa Chung Brook disc that I raved about, the Brook uh, Scottish Fantasy and First Violin Concerto on Decca. I mean, Kempe was also, you know, he was in Munich. He did, he accompanied Nelson Freire in some of his early recordings, wonderful Schumann and Grieg piano concertos and stuff. I mean, you know, there was Kempe doing his thing. And he, he actually had a career, I believe he was an oboist. He was a wind player. He wasn't a pianist. He wasn't a violinist. He was a woodwind player, which, of course, is one of the things that made him so, so attentive to orchestration, to the sound of the orchestra, to the ability to just breathe life and color and vigor and rhythm into accompanimental music or into music that does not emphasize the, the usual strictures of the German contrapuntal school. And so for that reason, it is a very interesting thing to take a look and a listen to what Kempe's best recordings are and see how this, this reality, the fact that he was um, first and foremost, I think, a, a, just a great opera conductor, but beyond that, a non-German German conductor, what this does for his discography. Because I can tell you right now, you will find no Beethoven in it and no Brahms. And that, I think, is really quite, quite interesting, given how much of that he did and, and where his, 
his uh, his his natural affinities ought to have been. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask you to just hop on over and take a look and see if 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 you know how this this cultural milieu in which Kempo grew up and worked, um, you know, conflicted with his actual predilections and what the results were in terms of his discography. I think it's a really kind of interesting question. I don't really have the answer. All I know is what his 10 best recordings were, and I hope you'll join me in talking about them. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me, and thank you very much for considering subscribing to ClassicsToday.com. Take care.